What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Elder Christopher Golden Jr. was given on February 8, 2011. We are pleased to have Elder Christopher Golden as our mor this morning's devotional speaker. Elder Golden was sustained as a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy in March 2001. He has served as an area authority in both the Africa Southeast and Africa areas, as well as the President of the Africa Southeast area and Counselor in the Africa West area. He is an experienced businessman with a background in banking, pharmaceuticals, and optical marketing. He graduated from the University of South Africa in Pretoria, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and a postgraduate honors degree in international politics. He has served the Church as a full-time missionary in South Africa, ward and stake young men's president, institute teacher, bishop, stake president, and area director for the Church educational system. Elder Golden is married to Diane Hubbard, and they are parents of four children and have one grandchild. And now we'll be pleased to hear from our good friend, Elder Golden. In preparing my remarks for today, I could not help remembering a recent experience of mine. Some months ago, I enjoyed the privilege of presiding at a state conference alongside Elder Donald J. Kyes, one of our noble Aries Seventies. During the course of the Saturday evening session, often one of the highlights of a state conference, we were required to adjust our program at short notice because of the inclusion of some additional speakers. In view of the fact that the duet sung by a young couple was to be moved, in the program to follow Elder Kaiser's remarks and precede mine, I accordingly quietly whispered the proposed change in the program to him. After doing so, it was quickly apparent that he had not fully grasped what I had said, which required me to repeat my message a second time. Unfortunately, this time, uh, to my dismay, his lack of understanding was now amplified by a look of incredulity and utter disbelief. Realizing now that I had somehow failed in my attempt to clearly convey the change in our program, I repeated my message in a manner which could not be mistaken. I said, and this time more clearly and slowly than I had done before previously, but with some added emphasis. Don, the duet will be sung between you and me. <laughs> this time, my message hit the mark, for now his incredulity and disbelief was replaced by a nervous giggle and a hint of terror. <laughs> I then reviewed carefully in my mind what I just said, and had at last realized my terrible error for when I had said the duet will be sung between us, he had taken my words literally. In other words, he had understood that the duet would be sung by the two of us. Now, I am pleased to reassure all of you here today that neither I nor President Samuelson has any intention of singing any duet anywhere at any time, to anyone. <laughs> My beloved brothers and sisters, it is truly a rare privilege to be in your presence today. As I speak, our children and their families are viewing this broadcast in our home back in South Africa, where it is just after 8 o'clock in the evening. Just think about the power of modern technology. One day when I am released from this calling, Diane and I expect 
to sit alongside our children in our home in Featherbrook, South Africa, and continue to enjoy the blessings of these great gatherings via satellite broadcast. I'm pleased to convey the love and greetings of the First Presidency to you alongside your parents and loved ones, the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as stewards of the keys of the Kingdom of God have a deep interest in you and an abiding faith in your progress and development. When one considers the glorious work of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, nothing surpasses in importance and power the restoration of a true knowledge and understanding of God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, our Saving Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Faith in a real and living God in the world we now live is in steep decline the very existence and mission of Jesus Christ has been diluted by so-called believers. Some who now ascribe to a belief that Jesus Christ was a great moral teacher at best, and some a good man with some flaws at the very least. In contrast, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints theology stands fast as a beacon of undiluted testimony in the living reality of God, our eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. We believe the Holy Scriptures as they have fallen from the lips of holy prophets. We also believe in continued revelation as it comes to us through authorized and inspired Latter-day prophets and apostles. We are not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. In this regard, the singular importance of the first vision and the Prophet Joseph Smith's first-hand witness of the Father and the Son are wonderfully echoed in the Saviour's intercessory prayer, as recorded in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. In this prayer of prayers which the Son of God offered, on the eve of his atonement, the Lord declared, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In our discussion this morning, we will consider two principles that are fundamental to our faith. The first is a correct understanding of God. The second applies to our relationship with God. In regard to the actual existence and correct understanding of God, I will simply note here that it is hard to imagine any concept or idea that has been more misunderstood, distorted, or abused during the past 2,000 years. To many, God is mystical and distant. To others, he is nothing more than a manifestation of nature around us, and to others, he is a spirit who reigns in terrible power and judgment, while to a few, God is the invention of a childlike, unimproved mind. The diversity of beliefs is truly bewildering and baffling. I will provide here only one example among the countless of how differently God is viewed even among those within Christianity itself. Aristides II, century Christian apologist, declared, quote, God is not born nor made. He is immortal, perfect, and incomprehensible. He has no name, for everything that has a name is related to created things. He has no form, nor bodily members or limbs. He is neither male nor female." End of quote. I shall not comment specifically in Aristides' description of God, but I cannot forego the moment to simply say that Aristides' statement is much falsehood speckled with some truth. 
Even when acknowledging the fact that he lived during the second century when the early church was already in apostasy, one has to say that his statement does not conform to the Old Testament, nor the Gospels and the Apostolic Epistles that were reasonably well in circulation among the early Christians during Aristides' day. It is important to realize that the restoration of the true knowledge of God and therefore of our Heavenly Father and His Son preceded the restoration of any laws, ordinances, or principles that had to be once again restored in connection with this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. There is something wondrous about the faith and the purity of the boy Joseph Smith in the spring of 1820, as he entered the grove of trees with a prayer in his heart. He inquired as to which of all the religious parties were right, so that he could know which one to join because of his deep concern for the welfare of his immortal soul. Beyond Joseph Smith's brief but deeply spiritual account, the earnest reader is drawn into this event in a very personal manner. We sense something of the glorious appearance of God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. We hear the Father call Joseph by name while turning to his beloved Son. We hear the Son as our saving redeemer and advocate with the Father address Joseph. Throughout the account, we sense the reality, nearness, and approachableness of our Heavenly Father and His Son. And we are renewed in our testimony that God is real and mighty to save. After the first visitation and vision, other manifestations followed, which caused the Book of Mormon to come forth and the necessary priesthood, authority, covenants, and ordinances to be restored. In short, all the power and knowledge necessary for gaining eternal life was once again restored to mankind, but only after the true nature of the Father and the Son had been revealed. The Prophet Joseph was later to able to testify with unusual authority, quote, it is the first principle of the gospel to know with a certainty the character of God and to know that we can converse with him as one man converses with another." End of quote. In regard to our relationship with God, which is the second fundamental principle which we will consider here today, I refer to one uh, doctrine a false doctrine of predestination, which should be sufficient for our purposes. This doctrine was expanded upon by the fifth century Christian theologian Augustine of Hippo and has governed mainstream Christianity for many centuries. According to predestination, the destiny of any soul is predetermined by God before any act good or evil, has been committed by any man or woman. I will only say here that there is a terrible logic to a belief in a God who prejudges us, even when His judgment is always perfect. There is also the depressing arithmetic of a teaching which holds that nothing that we do or ever will do in the future will influence God's grace or deflect His justice. We are thereby left with our final fate fixed because God's prejudgment of us. Any thoughtful believer will readily discern the self-defeating potential of this incorrect doctrine of predestination, as well as the hopelessness it could produce in individuals. It is therefore not surprising that much of mankind over the ages have approached God with great fear and trepidation. 
In this regard, I refer to the well-known example of Martin Luther, the great reformer. When he was a young man before he embarked on the ministry as a monk, and some years before his work as a reformer, he had two experiences which greatly affected him. The first of these events occurred in 1503 when a dagger pierced his leg, rupturing an artery which could have caused him an untimely death. The second event occurred two years later in 1505. He was caught in a heavy thunderstorm which was so violent that he felt sure he was not going to survive. It was this latter event, in fact, which caused Luther to promise that he would become a monk if his life was spared. However, the most telling part in both of these life-threatening events was that Luther, when in fear of his life, not once called upon the Lord for help. Instead, and from a, the Latter-day Saint point of view, quite surprisingly, he called upon two venerated saints for help. In the first instance, when his leg was injured, he implored Mary, the mortal mother of the Savior, to help him, while in the second event, during the terrifying thunderstorm, he turned his calls for help to St. Anne, who is believed to have been the mother of the same Mary. In later years, Luther regretted his behavior for not calling upon the Lord during these situations. One possible reason for a good man, like Martin Luther, not to have turned to his heavenly father, is found in what he said at one time, quote, if I could believe that God was not angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy, end of quote. We should also remember that Martin Luther was not unique in these views. In fact, they were typical in a society in which man feared God and stood in terror of Christ as our judge. Let's now consider our understanding of our relationship with God as Latter-day Saints. I begin with this inspired comment by the Prophet Joseph, quote, if men do not comprehend the character of God, they do not comprehend themselves, end of quote. Through the glorious principles once again restored, we are taught that the fatherhood of God our Father predates mortality. He is literally our Heavenly Father, in other words, the Father of our spirits. The Savior, Jesus Christ, is therefore, in the literal sense of the word, our elder brother as the firstborn spirit child of, of God, the Eternal Father. This vital understanding entirely changes the nature of our relationship with God. The Savior's recurring expressions during his mortal ministry now more fully resonate with us. Just think for a moment about the following expressions. Our Father, which art in heaven, be ye therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I send unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. We are reminded of the prophetic declaration by modern-day prophets and apostles in the family, a proclamation to the world, which declares, quote, All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual, pre-mortal, mortal and eternal identity and purpose. In the pre-mortal realm, spirit sons and daughters knew and worshiped God as their eternal father and accepted his plan by which his children could obtain a physical body 
and gain eternal experience to progress toward perfection and ultimately realize his or her divine destiny as an heir of eternal life. The divine plan of happiness enables family relationships to be perpetuated beyond the grave. Sacred ordinances and covenants available in holy temples make it possible for individuals to return to the presence of God and for families to be united eternally." End of quote. Because of the restoration and because of a true and fuller understanding of mankind's origin and destiny, we know that we are not predestined to anything. Each one of us is, in fact, foreordained unto salvation and exaltation. The undergirding principle of foreordination is quite simple. Every soul who has been born into this world has already earned certain privileges on account of their faithfulness in their first estate. These privileges include an unconditional right to receive an immortal and resurrected body one day, and secondly, a conditional blessing, which is dependent on our faith and obedience to God of enjoying everlasting felicity and eternal life in the presence of the Father and the Son. Now, I should like to turn for a few minutes to the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has many vital roles. However, I would like to refer to one which was so well expressed many years ago by Elder Orson Pratt of the Twelve. Quote, water baptism is only a preparatory cleansing of the believing penitent, whereas the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost cleanses more thoroughly by renewing the inner man and by purifying the affections, desires, and thoughts which have long been habituated in the impure ways of sin. Without the aid of the Holy Ghost, a person would have but very little power to change his mind and to walk in newness of life. Though his sins may have been cleansed away, yet so great is the force of habit that he would, without being renewed by the Holy Ghost, be easily overcome and contaminated again with sin. Hence, it is infinitely important that the affections and desires should be, in a measure, changed and renewed so as to cause him to hate that which he before loved and to love that which he before hated. To thus renew the mind of man is the work of the Holy Ghost." End of quote. It is not surprising that the Prophet Joseph Smith counseled, quote, Tell the people to be humble and faithful and sure to keep the Spirit of the Lord, and it will lead them right. Be careful and not turn away the small, still voice. It will teach you what to do and where to go." End of quote. Now, as we've gathered here this day, it is my feeling that on many of you, if not all, the Spirit and the power of the Lord is rested in some way. All of us are sometimes unaware of the goodness of the Lord and His remarkable influence in our lives. Far too often, too many worthy and humble saints have wondered about their personal condition or worthiness before the Lord. The Book of Mormon records that the Lamanites who had been converted by Ammon, had offered a sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and because of their faith, had been baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. I believe this to be applicable to many of the saints in our day. I also believe it to be true of many in this gathering here today. 
on the eve of the Savior's atonement and great sacrifice, he promised these apostles that he would send them the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Christ, we are told, will fight our battles, and the Holy Ghost, which whispereth through and pierceth all things, will guide us. In conclusion, I turn to this, the sweetest of our Lord's invitations. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, my beloved brothers and sisters, I cannot forego the sacred responsibility and privilege of declaring my testimony of the reality of our glorious Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ, as the resurrected and glorified Son of our Heavenly Father, is our Savior and Redeemer. He is our Advocate. He is not an absentee Master. Ours is the privilege not to wonder at these things. I leave you with my assurance and testimony of this divine work, and my earnest prayer that our Heavenly Father will pour out upon you His richest blessings. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Elder Christopher Golden, Jr. was given on February 8, 2011 